welcome to our live webcast looking at some fossils behind the scenes at the Smithsonian's National Museum of Natural History. My name is Grace Costantino and I'm the Outreach and Communication Manager for the Biodiversity Heritage Library, or BHL. And I want to first start by thanking our Fossil Fossic volunteers who helped make this webcast possible. So if you followed our Fossil Stories social media campaign a couple of weeks ago, a uh, social media campaign that celebrated fossils, in the history of paleontology, you know that part of that campaign was a challenge to, to transcribe nine field books from paleontologists at the Smithsonian, and the reward for successfully transcribing those within the campaign was this live periscope here. So since we're live, you know that we successfully completed that challenge. We had 252 pages successfully transcribed and reviewed in just three and a half days. So thanks to all of our wonderful volunteers before we get started, two things. So this is a live webcast, of course, so we will be keeping track of your questions and trying to answer as many of them as we can at the end of the event. So just type in your questions and we'll try to get to those. Also, we are behind the scenes, so you might notice some vent noise in the background. We'll be trying to speak up as loud as we can. We have a microphone on my phone here to try to pick up all that we're saying, but if you have any trouble hearing, just go ahead and let us know and we'll try to speak up. So without any further ado, I would like to introduce the star of our show, Dr. Nicholas Pyenson, who is the curator of fossil marine mammals here at the Smithsonian National Museum of Natural. Hello, Nick. Thanks for being with us today. Hey, Can you tell us a little bit more about yourself sure. and your work? Uh, happy to. Uh, so I'm curator of fossil marine mammals here at the Smithsonian's National Museum of Natural History. Um, and I have the uh, extreme privilege to be the steward, for now, of something on the order of 15,000 specimens of extinct seals, dolphins, whales, sea cows, all these different mammals that went back to the oceans that once had land ancestry. Um, and the Smithsonian's collections are the best in the world, the greatest coverage, the biggest um, uh, coverage both in terms of time and space, all the geologic periods, all the continents. Um, and uh, what I thought would be fun is to kind of share some active stories with you guys, uh, if that's all right. Great, so, let's do it. Okay, let's do it. We'll go over here. Um, since, we, since we started with BHL, um, maybe we want to start by talking about the importance of old books, um, because I think that was on Twitter for a bit. Um, we're fortunate at the Smithsonian of having resources like the Smithsonian Libraries and Smithsonian Archives. Um, between the two, we have kind of endpoints for how knowledge is processed about the world, whether it's in terms of archiving a whole body of work that one individual may have created, if not now, maybe hundreds of years ago, and we want to know everything about them, from their field notes to their correspondence, um, to photos that may never have been published of important specimens. Equally, we want to be able to access the literature in its physical format. And here I thought would be a great example of why old books are important. I have before us uh, a large folio volume, uh, and uh, it's called the Osteographie de Cetacee, the Osteography of Wales. And this was um, a long-term effort by two scholars, Van Beneden and Gervais, uh, Belgian scholars who worked at the end of the 19th century to create a catalog of everything that was known about the bones of whales and dolphins. Um, and so they created this magnificent volume and it goes through our knowledge at the time of the world of cetaceans. And you can see, oh, this is a great example, we were looking for this earlier, of um, a full uh, full page spread of, in this, in this case, it's a skeleton of a large baleen whale. And you actually have several species here, but this is showing different osteological elements, complete skeleton, individual ear bones. You can see the finger bones here, shoulder blades, beautiful kind of disc-shaped structures, individual skulls, cross sections within skulls. Um, this was unique in its time in being comprehensive providing us with views of material that are actually too large to handle ourselves. And were only actually housed at the major natural history museums of the time, key centers of learning that would aggregate knowledge about the natural world. Um, this is still relevant today because we know so little 
about the whales out there, their anatomy, their ecology, their physiology. We're still finding out fundamental things about them, and this is a perpetual resource. Now, you can see this online. You can go on to biodiversityheritagelibrary.org and download your own PDF. You can look at the, scroll through and look at these individual plates. I gotta say, there's nothing more handy than being able to walk down the hallway to the collections, the library collections here in paleobiology and seeing this firsthand. Um, and you can easily imagine seeing this level of detail in its original intended format, large format, is a far different experience than seeing it on screen. Um, there's just nothing like that. Um, equally, we have, so this is, uh, you could find this in other libraries in the world. Uh, having it readily accessible for researchers, that makes a huge difference. Uh, and certainly having it on your laptop, if necessary, that's a big deal too. And I've been in many situations where having that information on my laptop made the difference for doing research in settings that may not have been optimal, whether it's in the field or you're in an old dusty museum in a foreign country that doesn't have Wi-Fi access and you have the PDF on your laptop. Um, about old dusty museums, I was just in Argentina and um, Argentina benefits from the huge legacy of the Florentino brothers, uh, sorry, the Amagino brothers. Uh, Florentino and I forget his other brother, I should know that offhand. Um, there were three brothers. One of them was a lot more important than the other three, and that was Florentino. Uh, was largely the father of vertebrate paleontology in South America, uh, and would publish these incredible tomes describing fossil, mammal, and other vertebrate material from South America. And having access to this book on BHL uh, made the difference when I was in those collections looking at fossil uh, river dolphins in Buenos Aires, and I needed to see the original publication, see what was actually said, and comparing that in my hands with the actual specimen, along with um, digital models. It, I think we can segue to over on this side. So, so this story about using old literature becomes relevant because a lot of the descriptions that were made back in the day have not been altered by subsequent research. And that's a good thing. That says that in large part people got it right. So um, a recent story that um, you, you've probably heard about is the description of Isminia panamensis, a new fossil river dolphin. And what I want to show is kind of, um, so starting with the literature, we can talk about the full scope of what it takes to do research in this kind of setting. Uh, this is actually where a lot of researchers do their research, here in this layout space. It's nice and big. You can put a lot of material out, as we have here. Um, this is the real deal. This is the jaw of Isminia panamensis. And I remember finding it in the field. Um, 2011 off the coast of Panama with my colleagues from Stry, and you can see all those beautiful robust teeth. It almost looks like a crocodile jaw. I had this on out for national, for our, um, not National Fossil Day, but we had a big uh, parallel event here in our Curious Research Center. Um, and um, I have to compare next to it, the jaw of the living Amazon river dolphin. So this jaw is from a living species. This one's extinct. This is about six million years old, you can find this today in the Amazon River. Uh, and we have a fantastic modern collection. This is from our Department of Vertebrate Zoology. So being able to make these comparisons with living species and fossil ones are really relevant. I have these two out here because these are actually, as far as we can tell from the analysis we did, publishing on the description of this, which was in an open access journal. Uh, and I'll get back to that in a second. These two species are actually what we call sister texts. So they're the most closely related to each other of all other whales. Um, and you can kind of see hints of that with the teeth and the way how they look. Uh, and I can show you that in a little more detail here with the skulls. Now, one of the things with Isminia in particular was that the skull was so fragile when we collected it. I actually was not able to really bring it out here today because it was too fragile. And I'll show you why. A lot of the bones are incompletely preserved. This is the skull, but it's a 3D print. So I can do a lot of things with an exact duplicate, full size, that I couldn't do otherwise. Now, I have the two skulls in the same orientation here. Snout front, uh, going out to the front here. Many of the teeth are not preserved in Isminia, but you can see here that they're largely big and robust. Um, the blowhole, the bony blowhole was here, and so in life there'd be flesh on top, flesh on top of here. That's the bony blowhole. Uh, the eyes, so this is the eye of Isminia right here, and that's the eye of the living Amazon river dolphin. So we make these kind of side-by-side -side comparisons, and out of that, when we actually enter all the catalog of traits across many different species, and through all the traits that we want to look at, we can analyze them, and, and that gives us um, 
a hypothesis about their evolutionary relationships, a family tree. And that is the analysis that we did that showed that Isminia is actually the most closely related to the Amazon river dolphin of all other species. Now that's very interesting, and here's the 3D print of the jaws too, just for good measure. Now that's really interesting because this specimen was found in marine rocks. This lives in freshwater river environments. So at some point in the evolutionary history, uniting these two species, there had to have been a changeover from life at sea to life in freshwater rivers. And that, had, that likely happened somewhere in South America after about six million years ago. So the fossil record is a way to actually constrain many larger scenarios we have about the evolution of, in this case, freshwater river dolphins in South America. 3D, now what's really important about this, and I'm gonna try to bring it up on my laptop here, um, if we can do that. Um, now I wanted to show um, a really fun, so it's many of it was, featured in the Washington Post. Maybe some of you actually read this on the Metro uh, about a month ago. Um, I was very happy about that. It, it really got a lot of coverage, uh, in part because we were able, let me see, I didn't quite pull up this 3D model, but I'll do it right now. Um, we published in an open access journal called PeerJ, um, and that allows for anybody to see the entire publication. If you go to PeerJ and look up um, if you Google River Dolphin Pier J, you should, or Fossil, Fossil Dolphin Pier J, you should be able to find our description of this mini. And in it, we actually have figures that show the 3D model. I'll just open that up here. And you can see that here's the fossil, here's a 3D model, and then all the way down here are different views. Now, what's really cool, if you go to the caption for that, these little hot links will take you to Smithsonian X3D. And that will actually provide, as long as we have internet connection, let's get back here. That link seems to be broken. Oh, that's great. Here we go. Over at Smithsonian X3D, you can see here's the jawbone that I was just showing you. And this is a 3D model. So you can actually measure this, look at it. Uh, you can even download it in 3D print your own. So it's great to have 3D prints as an example of something that you can use in a museum setting. Uh, but it's equally usable if you can download it and 3D print it on your own 3D printer, if you have access to it, um, in a variety of educational settings. And I think that's one way to make the museum's walls transparent. And that's part of our, I think, broader mission in the 21st century for natural history museums to stay relevant is for the people to know what we hold in trust. The catalog of biodiversity, both in today's world and all past worlds, too. Uh, and that's really important to me. Um, I think, uh, maybe, do you want to take some questions here for, uh, about fossil river dolphins? So if you're just joining us today, we're behind the scenes at the Smithsonian National Museum of Natural History. We're looking at some fossil collections of some marine mammals with Dr. Nicholas Heisman here. And here we have Megan Farader. She's the coordinator of the Smithsonian Transcription Center has been helping us out. Megan, what sort of questions have we been getting? So one great one, and it's a biggie. So Nick, what is your favorite fossil of the entire collection? So, um, go top five. sure, top five. I'll just give you my top one at the moment because this is like asking a parent what you know who their favorite kid is or something like that. Um, and uh, I, I get that question a lot. Uh, right now, um, my current favorite is the one I just described, Isminia panamensis. Um, that's that's uh, and the reason why is not because it's especially beautiful. Of course, I think that. I think that about almost every fossil I come across. Very few of them, even the most incomplete ones, are um, special. They're informative. They're, they're a vestige of a past world that nobody actually saw. Uh, the reason why is because you put so much effort into getting that piece of knowledge about the past into you know, the greater body of scientific knowledge through peer review. You get the material photographed. You get it 3D scanned. You have to actually do the science. That takes a long time. It was found in 2011 and published in 2015. I've had people say, boy, four years, that's a long time. What were you doing? Well, there's a lot of other things going on. And so science takes time, uh, especially if we want to make it transparent, uh, especially if we want it to have the highest visibility possible, which I think is really important. So um, I like to really, I cherish these kinds of moments, and that's what makes it special to me. That's my favorite at the moment. Um, I can tell you, I can give you a little preview here, actually. In December, I'll have a new favorite. Um, it's going to be pretty interesting. Uh, it's another fossil whale that will be coming out. I can't tell you 
much more than that. But I can tell you that you should read a Pulitzer Prize winning book by Nathaniel Philbrick called In the Heart of the Sea. There's going to be a movie coming out in December. And just stay tuned for more information about fossil whales because there should be something special coming out then. And one other question, which I think relates more widely to opportunities to come behind the museum's walls. Someone asked the question, how can they become a paleontologist over the summer? It probably means, you know, how can they get involved? How can they begin their studies or find opportunities to help with the Smithsonian in various labs and with fossils? So we have a huge volunteer core. And there is a volunteer, there is a training program for people to work on the preparation of fossil material. There's a full scope of needs that we have. Everywhere from, I can actually, this is a great segue, volunteers in our fossil lab, which you can go see if you go up to Last American Dinosaurs, an ongoing exhibit in the Natural History Museum. Take a peek through the glass, through the glass windows of the volunteers working inside an area that we call the fossil lab. They're actually building the foam structures that cradle, in this case, 3D print, but they also cradle real specimens. I don't have some of those out there. This is a labor of love. It takes time to actually do this right, to have the specimen nestled just right in the cradle with these kinds of borders that prevent somebody from scraping off the top. I can't underscore how important it is to have as many of our specimens as possible in these kind of archival storage solutions. We play the long game at museums. And if we do our job right, this kind of protection and this kind of storage jacket too, which was built again by hand, that allows these specimens to persist in museum collections. And that is our job, is to be the stewards for these specimens, to know about them, to share that knowledge, but also to make sure that they survive. In many cases, fossils are on their way to becoming dust. So our job is to retard that process, slow that down, decades, centuries, if at all possible, so that other people can study it. Because you never know when museum collections can become incredibly relevant. We today are living in an era that many people have called the Anthropocene. The human fingerprint on the natural world is so incredible, so vast, that we are now ecosystem engineers. We're actually planetary engineers. The Anthropocene describes that human era of impact on the natural world. If we want to know anything about what the future might be, we need to know about the immediate past, about how the world once was, 50 years ago, 100 years ago, several hundred years ago, sliding back into geologic time. That record of how the world was is stored in natural history museums around the world. So that's kind of why I think natural history museums are not an outdated idea. They're going to become more and more relevant in the coming future as the world actually changes at geological scales, both in magnitude and rate. So we have a little bit of issue with volume, so if we can focus in on that, that would be great. And then secondly, we have two more additional questions. One is about the discovery of fossils. So are there places in the world where you don't find fossils? So that's a great question. I mentioned earlier that we find fossils all throughout the world, especially for marine mammals. Now, what I mean by that is to say that most continents are pretty well represented, that we have fossils from actually every continent, of fossil whales in particular, but they're not all equally distributed throughout the world. So we'll find them in specific places. In the case of marine mammals, we'll find them in places that used to be oceans that are now emergent on land or have been uplifted, or any place that we can actually access those rock outcrops. If there's vegetation, if there's cities, if there's anything covering that, you're not going to find the fossils. But to take a step back, not every time period is actually preserved equally. There are many time periods for which we don't really have that much of a record. Even most recently with the ice ages, the action of glaciers growing and then scraping back entire surfaces of land. That's one good example of destroying a record of rock that might otherwise be preserved. So we don't get everything from the past. There's a loss of knowledge. And that's what makes paleontology very much like a detective story. We want to know about the distant past. From that, we get incomplete knowledge. So how do you deal with that? How do you test ideas scientifically with incomplete knowledge? Well, this is the same challenge that detectives have of any stripe. So you use inference. You use multiple lines of evidence. You use comparisons. And it's from that that we actually can generate 
testable ideas and know something about a past that nobody saw. And that's part of what makes it really magical to be a paleontologist, to look at the deep past, because uh, we do actually have the real thing. So, sorry, really quick, I'm just curious to learn a little bit more about your experience discovering this fossil. Yeah. Did you expect to find it yeah, there, or so, did you just stumble upon it? So that's a great story. Um, I received a phone call from a colleague at STRI, Smithsonian Tropical Research Institute, in Panama. And he said, uh, I have an undergrad student who just found this, what looks like a fossil dolphin. Do you want to come down and take a look? And we can apply for permits and collect it. And I said, sure, that sounds good. Uh, and I saw a few photos and I said, I think this is something that we did not know about previously. There's not much of a fossil marine mammal record from Panama, especially from that area of the world, more or less equatorial. So I said, let's go get it. And just looking at it from the field photos of the teeth, actually, what I could see, I can show you here in the, in the 3D print. This is how it was preserved in the field, this side up, which is why all this part of the skull was eroded away. You can see what the actual skull looked like when we look at it from this way. That's kind of in the same anatomical orientation as this skull. So what we should have had is this whole other part of the skull right here, but we didn't because it was sitting like that and getting eroded by wave action and exposure to the elements. So I could see these teeth and I said, you know, from the photos, I think this is a kind of species that we have up here in Maryland from the Calvert Cliffs called shark tooth dolphins. And that's what we called it for a long time until I brought back the big plaster jacket. And you can actually see field photos of this in our publication and online at my lab webpage. Um, photos of what it looked like taking this out uh, from the field. Preparing it over the course of a year and a half, we realized there were jaws underneath the skull that were very well preserved. And once I had the whole skull out, I said, you know what, this is not what I thought it was. It's something different. And I thought that it was probably pretty close to the Amazon River Dolphin and the La Plata River Dolphin, something that's closely related to this as well. Sort of a longer slinky snout. Um, and that was really exciting. That's the process of discovering and revising your previous ideas uh, it takes a while until you really know what you have, and that's that's why science takes time. Mm -hmm. um, speaking about long snouts, one of the fun things I wanted to bring out was um, something I mentioned earlier as a sneak peek of what we're doing. So um, these skulls belong, I mentioned some uh, earlier about fossils that we have here in Maryland along the Calvert Cliffs. You can see this hugely long snout. So this is probably what we'd call a long-snouted dolphin from today. Around 15 million years ago, this is what a long snouted dolphin looked like. And you can see that if you have the skull in the same orientation with the blowhole here, blowhole here, and the eyes here, eyes here, this is the elongation of the snout. We call the the rostrum. It houses all the teeth. It's the beak of the dolphin. You can just see how incredibly long it is here. And there's a little bit of plaster that was used to repair it back in the 1950s. <coughs> Turns out this kind of material is very commonly found along the Calvert Cliffs. A lot of them have been recovered, collected, brought back to museums. The Smithsonian has a lot of these skulls. Uh, and I we can walk around the corner and I'll show you just how many we have. Uh, the Calvert Marine Museum down in the Solomons uh, has, a, has a lot of fossils too from the Calvert Cliffs. Uh, I'd say those are the two main collections. And so this is kind of spectacular. You know, arguably there's no other fossil whale on the planet with a snout this long. And there's many species, as it turns out. We have several, uh, we have a large collection of individuals from this species in particular. And uh, with a student who's here for a year, Aus an Australian student named Matt McCurry. He's on Twitter. He was tweeted. Uh, I tagged him in one of the photos before uh, this periscope. Um, what we're doing is we're taking these skulls upstairs to the Department of Anthropology, which has a medical grade CT scanner, and putting old fossils through a hospital CT scanner is actually a very relevant exercise for seeing the internal anatomy that's not visible from the exterior. This is important because dolphins have undergone so many evolutionary changes in the bones of their skull. Uh, the elongation of many skull bones over each other just kind of create this layer cake of uh, anatomical mystery that still hasn't really been resolved for many fossil species. With Matt in particular, Matt is um, a biomechanist and a comparative uh, morphologist. He's really interested in understanding how special structures have evolved multiple times in very distantly related species 
he's looked at gharials, crocs, a variety of reptiles that have long snouts, and so we decided to pick a really good mammalian example, and this is probably the best one. And so what we're doing in particular is we really want to get CT data of the entire snout, which gives us not only the external shape, but also the internal shape, with which we can then test with basic parameters that are known in physics for understanding how these snouts might have worked in reality, because all we're left with are fossils, and we don't really actually know what these did in life, but maybe we can generate a series of hypotheses to test about what these different kinds of long snouts did. So that's an active, you're getting an insight into research happening this moment. Mm -hmm. uh, and we can walk over to the side if you want to see more of these. Yeah, mm -hmm. and before we do that, real quick, for oh. those who are just tuning in, can you say again what species this long sure. snout was from um, and the, how right, old it I is? I didn't actually say it because <laughs> it, the current name for this species is Zithiacetus. Now it's spelled with an X, X I. P-H-I-A-C-E-T-U-S. Now, Zithius is actually the living species of uh, swordfish, I think. It's either swordfish or billfish. I, it's complex taxonomy. But that's a good segue to showing you this fossil here. Uh, not a marine mammal, but found in the same kinds of rock units. This is the skull, and actually, if you come over here, this is the skull. These are fossil billfish skulls. Now, the beak has been snapped off through the processes of geologic time. We don't actually get them preserved but the rest of the skull is preserved. You can see the eye bone here. Uh, you can see parts of the jaw here. This is the rest of the skull. These are beautiful fossils, and they're found in very similar rocks. So this begs the question of whether or not these dolphins were, did they evolve into the billfish kind of morphology? Were they feeding the same way? That's a very basic question that we should be able to test by collecting CT data. So. And I'd be remiss if I didn't say, you know, a lot of these fossil collections are generated by collectors who are nice enough to donate these collections. In this case, Kent Gibson uh, collected let's see, this skull here recently off the coast of Oregon, which is featured here in this map. Uh, Lincoln County, Oregon is one of the great uh, fossil gold mines for um, extinct marine mammals. Uh, many of our collections are actually from that county in particular that are rich with fossil marine mammals, seals, dolphins, uh, bizarre species that no longer exist that have been collected there for really over 100 years. Uh, we have several thousands of those fossils here. But again, we have fossils from all around the world, too. So. All right, you want to go around the corner? Yeah, uh, do you want to do questions first? Or? Question. Yeah. Um, uh, from some of our volunteers, and as a result of our Fossil Plastic Challenge leading into Fossil Week, we transcribed field notes from um, paleobiologists and paleontologists. So some questions about uh, linking the current processes, things happening at Biodiversity Heritage Library, of making that material available, being able to transcribe it. Do you foresee any additional materials coming into Transcription Center or being digitized and brought into BHL soon that are related to um, historical research that can be used for comparison to contemporary research? Sure, absolutely. And, I, and so a good example of that, we have a lot of this, but a good crystal clear example of that is with the uh, FW True Love um, uh, transcription that we had earlier this year in February. Frederick Willem True was one of the great marine mammal curators of the Smithsonian. He uh, did a lot of his work in the late 19th century and early 20th century, died relatively young. Uh, but he left a large number of uh, notebooks, both field notes and correspondence that has never been transcribed, never even been digitized. And of course a lot of these materials from the late 19th century are right in that realm of having been written on non-acid free paper. So they are crumbling to bits as we as we work with them. So ideally, we'd like to digitize this first, and then because these are all written in beautiful handwriting, which is one something you can identify. You can identify individual curator's handwriting based on the scraps and notes that you'll sometimes find in museum drawers. Um, we sent a lot of that material to the transcription center because it had, in True's own record, his field notes of collecting many of the type of specimens that we hold here. Um, and I very much would like to do that for a lot of other a lot of other collections that we have. Yeah, so we'll be doing this again. Stay tuned. Okay. Any other questions before we sort of uh, go Yes, one, one other one. Would something, uh, conditions like lava, be too hot to preserve fossils? Would it destroy uh, animal? So great. That's a great question. And the answer is no. There are many fossils, there are, there are many cases of fossils that have been preserved in lava. Um, think of it, you know, humans have been preserved in the ash from that most famous example is Pompeii. Um, there is a great example of a fossil rhino that was found out west. I think it was the Columbia flood basalts. Spectacular event in Earth history in North America. Um, 
that allowed for the preservation of this uh, around 20 million year old uh, fossil walrus, uh, fossil, walrus, fossil rhino. And um, all that's preserved is its body cavity in this giant sequence of lava flows. Uh, and it took a paleontologist walking inside this little kind of what he thought was a cave, and then he found parts of the feet bones of that rhino and said, oh my goodness, this is lava flow that covered a single rhinoceros. And inside we have the body cavity preserved. There are dinosaur bones from Argentina that are preserved in lava flows too. So not every lava flow is going to preserve fossils because you have to actually find the result thereof, right? Um, but it, fossils are preserved in spectacular places and uh, settings you may not immediately imagine to be most conducive to their preservation. So, yeah. Pretty amazing. Let's. You want to go around the corner while we, until we get more questions. So our collections are are get a good shot looking right down here, Grace. Just the scope. Of, this is paleobiology is alone. Some forty million fossils, uh, individual specimens. And I'll walk around the corner here, and I'll show you just how many of these long beaked dolphins and whales we have. Uh, every one of these storage jackets here is another skull that has a relatively long beak. You can see where the skull might have been, or where the skull is and where the snout is. Um, and so we just have a great collection here that has been generated by the fundamental activity of going out into the world and collecting fossils over the course of hundreds of years, but that's millions of people hours. Um, just think about all the effort it takes to collect a fossil, get it to some place, a road where you can bring it back to the museum, and then prepping that fossil and putting it in a storage cradle. That takes a lot of time. And so um, that's, those are all the necessary steps we need to do just before we actually do the real science. And I think that, I think about that a lot whenever I'm handling fossils, that it's not just about the extinct species that we're handling, but also about all the people hours that goes into it. Uh, that's something I really keep in mind and cherish very much and appreciate. So what's the age on a lot of these that we're looking at? Are they prehistoric? Or? Great question. The, we call these prehistoric. Um, these are all somewhere in the time range of 20 to about 5 million years ago um, in a time period we call the Neogene. Um, more people probably know about it if you said these are all Miocene dolphins. Uh, that's broadly what's what's included here. So. And does that match the fossils you were showing us on the table? It does. Back there? It okay. does. So those, that's the same. That time range encompasses the fossils on the table. Great. Yeah. Very cool. So we can walk back here and maybe field a few more questions. Yeah. It's worth noting that uh, Megan and Hillary here are working where researchers would work anywhere around here. Um, and these are the sort of research spaces that visitors from all around the world. We have visitors right now from Japan. Uh, let's see, where else? We have researchers from all around the world visiting and using our collections. And frequently they're users of our individual libraries too, and our field notes. A lot of times you have to chase down the origins of a lot of these fossils, where they're from, the specific maps, the field maps, where we think the fossils were collected. Because a lot of times the collectors are not alive and we can't talk to them. So we have to, again, this, the detective story takes on many different aspects whether it's chasing down the original records of how it was collected, or it's actual anatomy and phylogeny. That's another effort, too. So uh, these efforts are really um, time consuming, but they're also a lot of fun, too. So that's, that's why we do it. So I saw one question really quickly, this long nose yeah. also that we were looking at here. Someone was curious what this evolved into that we might have an equivalent today, or if there is an equivalent today. Great question. There, this left no descendants in today's oceans. Um, now, that is, that, that is such a good question that that's actually part of why we're doing this research, which is to know, did this somehow occupy a niche that is not present in today's oceans, these long-snouted dolphins? If, they, if dolphins have, broadly, have the ability to evolve these snouts, why don't we see this today? Was the world different enough around 15 million years ago that it somehow permitted the evolution of not just this species, but many other species with long snouts, and that somehow that niche is no longer here. There's no longer that whatever resource was available. Uh, maybe it wasn't just ecology. Maybe it was something about physical factors in the oceans, shallow shelf settings. Uh, maybe these were even going into freshwater river systems. We don't really know. We don't have those kinds of environments necessarily preserved. Uh, and we don't find many fossil whales from those kinds of environments. So we're left with a lot of uh, assumptions and um, inferences to make. Okay. 
Well, Megan, do we have any final questions before we wrap it up here? Sure. Um, one question was, are you familiar with the Paisley Caves of Lake County, Oregon? Yes. And then also a uh, sort of related question, which is how do you come about knowing, you know, just visually, knowing what you're looking at or when someone sends you a picture? And I'm sure you can tell us more about your experience and research process. So um, Paisley Caves in Oregon, uh, that is a site that preserves a lot of bones of Ice Age terrestrial mammals. I happen to know that about that because several of my colleagues, close colleagues, have uh, worked on those fossil deposits, some of which I think are collected and are in natural history museums in the out west. I think Berkeley, I think uh, Eugene, Oregon also has some of those collections. Um, surprising that a marine mammal expert would know about that. Um, for my own process, um, how we know, how I'm able to go through the collection and just kind of identify a lot of these. Uh, that's many years of anatomical training to be able to take a fragment, a bone fragment, an incomplete fragment, and know immediately what side of the animal it belonged to, or what kind of animal it belonged to. Um, that's training that's built up by looking at a lot of bones and looking at a lot of bone fragments over many years. But uh, this is also a plug too for knowing the literature. and descriptions of anatomy and of whole species that are done in a clear way, either with photos, uh, today we use digital images and even 3D models. Um, I should also give a plug to Smithsonian 3D, part of the digitization program office. It's a lot of their great help and um, uh, expertise that were able to actually generate these 3D models. But going back to stuff in the 19th century, you'd have an army of artists illustrating these lithographs. The original authors, for the most part, weren't doing the illustrations. They had technicians to do that. And it's a tribute to their ability, to their fine eye, that they faithfully reproduced the original morphology. In many cases, we'd say that they got it right, for the most part, even though these are just illustrations by hand. And in some cases, these are showing structures that are not easily, really readily preserved. Here we have the malleus, incus, and staples of, these are the inner ear bones. Uh, sorry, the middle ear bones of a whale. Um, we have the same ones in our ear, Malleus incus stapes. Um, so they have this illustrated zoomed up at a large scale. This is much larger than it would be in life. Just wait for people to walk by here. Um, so um, having access to this material is part of what allows you to become uh, facile with new morphology. And um, so when you see something new, you know it's new and it's different from everything else you've seen. That's just part of uh, the training that goes into the science we do. Okay. All right, one more question and then I think we'll wrap it up. Yeah, um, Nick, would you tell us more about how people can learn more about opportunities yeah. here at the Smithsonian with Fossil Lab, how they can learn more about your research, various places they can find your published research as well as ongoing updates about what you're doing. And then also, we'll just go ahead and plug now, Biodiversity Heritage Library, where you can be involved with reading material and also helping with citizen science efforts. You can find that on Biodiversity Heritage Library's webpage and also the Smithsonian Transcription Center, where you can help by transcribing field notes from scientists. So where can they find more information about working in the fossil lab? So if you go to the Natural History Museum webpage, uh, mnnh.si, sorry, it's mnh.si.edu. Uh, and if you look under volunteer opportunities, also the paleobiology department's webpage should have a link to the fossil lab. And at worst, email us. Um, email somebody in our department. Um, and we will get you in touch with volunteer opportunities, getting your hands on fossils and um, helping with a lot of the mission that we have here at the Natural History Museum. If you want to follow updates, uh, we try to improve our visibility online by having web pages, a variety of web pages for the Department of Paleobiology also my own webpage. Following me on Twitter, that's a great way to actually stay up to date with updates. I'm also on Instagram too. I try to keep uh, fun things on both sides, especially about current activities. Um, and I think there was one more question about a uh, way to follow. I think online is really one of the best ways. Um, uh, Twitter especially, but also just staying abreast of what's going on in our Natural History Museum's website. Email newsletter. You'll we'll find more information as well. Yeah. And your Twitter, Twitter handle is Pines and Lab. Is that right? That's correct. All yep. right. Cool. Well, thank you so much, everybody. We really appreciate all the effort and time. Yeah. Huge benefit to everything we do here.
Yes, thank you for joining us so much. We will be archiving this broadcast today on YouTube, so we'll be tweeting the link out to that. Um, it will tweet out on BioDiv Libraries Twitter handle, as well as I'm sure Plants and Lab and Transcribe SI Twitter handle. So be sure to check it out and share it with your friends if you missed it, and then follow us on Twitter for more great information. And thanks again to all of our Fossil Fossic volunteers who made this event possible, and thanks to Nick for showing us some awesome behind-the-scenes fossils at the Smithsonian National Museum of Natural History. Bye, everyone.